Okay, we are here on East Confederate Avenue at Gettysburg, and today we're going to do a video and talk about an attack that happened to East Cemetery Hill on July 2nd, 1863, in the evening. And this attack uh, consisted of General Harry Thompson Hayes Brigade, as well as the brigade belonging to Colonel Isaac Irwin Avery. And also we're going to talk about a controversial matter, the spot and area in which Colonel Isaac Irwin Avery was mortally wounded, which would cause his death a few hours later. Um, so Harry, Harry Thompson Hayes Brigade and Isaac Irwin Avery's Brigade were side by side um, after coming from the north side of town, and if you want to go back and watch the video that I did on the brickyard, you'll see these two brigades attack soldiers at the brickyard. But they were side by side in a swale that existed um, on the ground that was created by Weinbrenner's Run. Now, I also did a video on the Weinbrenner house in the past, so you'll want to go back and watch that video as well. And this was, uh, this Weinbrenner's run, where these two brigades were, was east of Baltimore Street. Now, this swale, um, which can be seen in some 1880s photos that were taken from East Cemetery Hill, no longer exists today. It was actually destroyed... Um, when the construction for the Gettysburg Middle School and athletic fields uh, was put in. So these two brigades were lined up going in a southward direction. However, to attack the East Cemetery Hill, they would need to go east, um, which would cause these brigade commanders to have to do a right wheel. Um, and about 85 degrees, which would place them on the northeast corridor of East Cemetery Hill. Now, in front of us, you can see here the Henry Kalt Farm. Um, and running through the Henry Kalt Farm is Weinbrenner's Run. Weinbrenner's Run goes right through this for farm, and then it goes up into town um, and ends near the Weinbrenner house, which is across the street from what we know as the Farnsworth house today. Um, it's a small little run of water, um, and this would play an important part, not only in the action, but the placement of the mortal wounding of Colonel Isaac Irwin Avery. Because at the beginning of this action, Avery's Brigade is to the east side of Hayes' Brigade, which would be considered the Confederate left. You can also see here on the right this hilly area with a fence. Um, and, of course, this is what it looks like from on top here. And this is the swale, the old swale that was destroyed by the construction of the athletic fields and the schools. Now I've heard the placement of Avery's wounding uh, to be in the football field of the athletic fields, but I highly doubt that that is possible knowing the placement of Avery's brigade being to the east of Hayes' brigade, which was the Confederate left. With Avery's Brigade being on the east side of Hayes' Brigade, um, they are on the outside of the pivot of that right wheel maneuver, and therefore they would have had to travel further than Hayes' men. So what happens here in the evening of July 2nd, 1863, is that Avery's Brigade um, goes by and skirts the Henry Colt Farm. The brigade then crosses Weinbrenner Run, near where we are today, and then begins this right wheel into the area that you see in front of us. I'm going to zoom in on that area. That is the area that Avery's men are on the attack, and to the right of our camera now would actually 
be Hayes Brigade. So this is the right wheel that's going to go around that little line of trees there in the front and take you to East Cemetery Hill. So as they begin to wheel, just as we are walking now and heading out into this field, they would be just to the east of the current athletic football field, about 100 yards, or the distance of a football field. Now, as these men are making their way into this field, and they have haze to their right, remember, they are now coming under fire from East Cemetery Hill. The batteries up on Cemetery Hill, and I'll talk about them later on, as well as Von Giltz's men uh, on the road just below the hill, and of course, uh, the fifth main battery, Stevens Battery, over on the McKnight Hill, which would later become Stevens Knoll, firing right into their left flank. This is a very hot spot to be on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. In the position that the camera's going now on the left would be the 57th North Carolina. Where I'm at right now would be the 21st North Carolina with Avery behind the regiment. To my right, the 6th North Carolina, which would be the three units in Avery's brigade. Then to the right of the 6th North Carolina would be the 8th Louisiana. To their right, the 7th Louisiana. To their right, the 9th Louisiana. To their right, the 6th Louisiana. And then finally, to the extreme right at the Weinbrenner House, the 5th Louisiana. This would make up Hayes' brigade. As Hayes and Avery go toward East Cemetery Hill, in front of them is the brigade under General Von Gilsa. Firing directly into them at this spot, General Isaac Avery is mortally wounded with a shot to the neck, bleeding profusely. Now Avery was in front of his troops mounted on a great white horse. He was hit by shrapnel or some type of musket ball at the base of the neck and knocked from his saddle. Appearing on the scene was General John B. Gordon from Georgia, who would write years later in his diary, Resting on his elbows, I could see a gallant young Avery in his bloody gray uniform among his brave North Carolinians. From this area, the six-foot-two frame of the fallen rebel officer was transported with care to the Culp farm. As Avery was taken off the battlefield, Colonel A.C. Godwin of the 57th North Carolina took command of the brigade that a few moments ago was Isaac E. Avery's brigade. This is the spot in the general area where he was wounded. If you go to the pull-off for cars on East Confederate Avenue and look directly into the field at the woods, it's on the slight hill about halfway to the woods. In the distance, you can see the Culp Farm in which mortally wounded Isaac Avery was taken. This is the scribbled note that we'll talk about later on, which he wrote in the last moments of his life. Our camera is now facing the Gettysburg Middle School, and this is the area in which Hayes, Louisiana Brigade did their right wheel toward East Cemetery Hill. As with any battle, when officers are lost, the battle must continue on. So the brigade, Hayes Brigade, and now Godwin's Brigade, would continue the right wheel toward East Cemetery Hill. They would then face off with Von Gilsa. Now, looking at East Cemetery Hill, on the left side, which would be Von Gilsa's right, was the 33rd Massachusetts. Looking at the 33rd Massachusetts to their right would be the 41st New York. 
to their right, the 17th Connecticut. To their right, the 153rd Pennsylvania. To their right, the 68th New York. And to their right, the 54th New York. This area is always very special to me, not just because of the action that took place here on July 2nd, 1863, but just the fact that not many people have studied and know the facts about the movement and the right wheel toward East Cemetery Hill, which would give a very good idea of where Colonel Isaac Avery's mortally wounded spot was. I can pretty much estimate within about 25 yards of the spot that he fell. As we zoom in toward East Cemetery Hill, just a few hundred uh, yards away, you can only imagine of what the deadly fire was across this field on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. And this tree, a beautiful witness tree to the Battle of Gettysburg, is a white oak. We will walk over to it. This white oak is probably 170 years old, and it's uh, uh, in pretty good shape, and it's actually grown over a set of boulders. It can also be seen in some photographs taken from East Cemetery Hill as a young tree around the time of 1878 to 1880. Again, this is a white oak, and I like to call this the Isaac Avery witness tree because it is the tree that was closest to the wounding site of Isaac Avery on July 2nd of 1863. The regiment that right wheeled closest to this tree would be the 57th North Carolina. Just to the south side of this tree, closer to Culp's Hill, some men from Von Gilsa's 33rd Massachusetts moved about 150 yards forward and acted as skirmishers to hit the brigade on their left flank. Behind them, on Stevens Knoll, was the 5th Maine Battery firing artillery over the head of the 33rd Massachusetts skirmishers and right into the left flank of this Confederate attack. And this tree survived the thousands of bullets and shells that flew here on this field on that day. Now we're going to look at the base of this white oak, and you're going to see this uh, very large boulder that the tree has grown in, around, and through, and over. And it's an amazing tree. It's got a very deep uh, rooted system that goes well into 15 to 20 yards into the ground. If you walk out over the ground, you can actually feel the bulge of this enormous root system. Um, and it's amazing. Uh, I've been up in this tree. There, there's some amazing views uh, just on the lower branches of this tree. And unlike a lot of other trees that are this age, it's actually in pretty good shape. Once we leave this area where this white oak is, we're going to head over to Stevens Knoll and take a look at what would have been the artillery fire from the Union Army onto the Hayes and Avery, which now would become Godwin's Brigade, and their attack on East Cemetery Hill on the evening of July 2nd of 1862. Von Gilsa, who was just pictured there, his brigade is waiting just ahead. We are now at McKnight's Overlook, or McKnight's Hill, um, which would later be called Stevens Knoll for the 5th Main Battery that fired artillery in this direction that the camera is facing, right into Avery's and Hayes' brigade that were crossing across this field and heading toward Von Gilsa's brigade on East Cemetery Hill. This is actually one of the more 
picturesque spots on the Gettysburg battlefield if you care to come over here and look at it. And you can see from this uh, view viewpoint the extreme uh, advance and hillside of East Cemetery Hill. Now we go over to the 5th Main Artillery, also known as Stevens Battery. Now this particular battery, where this monument is, was commanded by Captain Greenleaf Thurlow Stevens. On July 1st, this battery was placed near Seminary Ridge by General John Fulton Reynolds. It fell back here to Cemetery Hill with the collapse of the Union Army on July 1st, and it was directed to McKnight's Hill, which was a small hill between Cemetery Hill and Culp's Hill. This position allowed this battery to pour deadly flanking fire at very close range right into the left flank of the Confederate attack of Avery's and Hayes' brigade. And if you look behind these guns, they still point in that direction today. As you can see the Henry Culp farm there in the distance. Now Captain Stevens was wounded on July 2nd and Lieutenant Edward N. Whittier took command of the battery afterward. All in all, the battery lost two enlisted men, two officers, and they had 11 wounded. This is the Chase Boulder. It has a very interesting story. Named for John F. Chase, one of the artillerists of the 5th Main Battery. He was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions at Chancellorsville. But on July 2nd, 1863, just two months later, the Confederates launched their attack on Cemetery Hill. Chase's battery fired with a devastating effect into their left flank. And in response to this, several Confederate batteries began targeting the 5th main position up here on what is today Stevens Knoll. A Confederate shell exploded near this rock where Chase was standing, and the blast took off his right arm, destroyed his left eye, and gave him 48 wounds to his body. He was carried unconscious to the rear and left for dead. Two days later, his body was loaded onto a wagon with others to be buried. Then, but then the wagon driver heard a moon, pulled him out from amongst the dead, and gave him a drink of water. The first words Chase said, did we win the battle? Amazingly, Chase was taken to the seminary hospital, survived the battle, and survived the war, being the most wounded man at any battle during the American Civil War with 48 wounds. So as you can see, those Stevens Knoll contains not very many monuments and just a battery up here. It is an extremely, extremely important part of the Battle of Gettysburg on July 2nd of 1863. In so much so that it was renamed from the McKnight Hill, which is the house there in the distance that I'm zooming into, to what it is today, Stevens Knoll, named after this battery and Captain Greenleaf Stevens and John F. Chase. Living in the house was James McKnight, and it's one of the spots that the 5th Main Battery, as well as many Union troops, passed by the McKnight house on their way into Gettysburg along the Baltimore Pike. On this next part of this video, we're going to drive away from Stevens Knoll and toward Von Gilsa's line. That general is General Leopold Von Gilsa. And his brigade would be on... Now, the monuments to Von Gilsa's brigade sit along today's Wainwright Avenue. Before the Civil War, this dirt road was actually used as an alternative to the Baltimore Pike. Wagons were able to pull heavy loads into town on this road. The photo above is Leopold von Gilsa. And over here to the left is the James McKnight Farm, which sits 
along the Baltimore Pike. The monument that we just passed was the 33rd Massachusetts, which was at the extreme right of Leopold von Gilsa's brigade. Ahead of us would have been the 41st New York of von Gilsa's brigade, followed by the 17th Connecticut, and then some more men from the 41st New York, which would have took the brunt of Avery's attack. Up ahead would be the 153rd Pennsylvania Volunteers. As you can see here on this map, if you want to pause it and take a look at the map. In the distance, you can see the steepness of East Cemetery Hill. And Von Gilsa's men from this point would be firing behind the camera across the field into the Confederate attack. Again, as we drive by here, and, and here we are at the 153rd Pennsylvania Monument, looking up the slope of East Cemetery Hill, and you can barely see the top of the East, uh, the cemetery gatehouse. Now we look across the field with the Confederate brigades are crossing this field, heading directly into this area of East Cemetery Hill across what today is Wainwright Avenue, a small dirt road in 1863, and then up the hill of East Cemetery Hill toward the Evergreen Cemetery Gatehouse, which was just a few years old at the time and was the town cemetery. If you look very closely, you can see the very top of East Cemetery Hill and the gatehouse roof. This is the area that Hayes Brigade of Louisiana soldiers from here through the rest of this road would come across this field, this deadly field, as Artillery's firing down on them from Stevens Knoll. Avery, their commanding officer, has been mortally wounded and taken back to the Culp Farm. And now the Louisiana Tigers, Zouave Regiment, would also charge across this field. Up ahead, the 68th New York the 54th New York, and then all the way at the end of the road on an angle would be the 75th Ohio, the 25th Ohio, and the 107th Ohio, which would be at an angle to meet the attack of the 5th, 6th, and 9th Louisiana of Hayes Brigade. They would be in line between the Weinbrenner and McCreary House, heading toward our camera now. In this area that we're in now, from right to the left would charge the Louisiana Tiger Zouave straight up this hill. Though they would be successful at reaching, they would not be able to get the support that they needed to continue and would later have to retreat across this field at the expense of hundreds of men and their commander, Isaac Avery. And this would be the end of this line along that wall, the 75th, 25th Ohio, and 107th Ohio. As we stand at the top of East Cemetery Hill, looking down the hill toward the Confederate attack, with this map of the battle, you can only imagine the artillery that must have been being fired from these artillery batteries of Ricketts Brigade onto the oncoming Confederate soldiers. It was also in this area around 1880, a photograph was taken, and I'll post it, of this area and what it looked like. And in that photograph, you can see the field of the Confederate attack. Up on this hillside, the 1st New York Light Artillery, 
the fourth U.S. battery, the first PA, Ricketts battery, all firing their guns down into that deadly field of fire. Also, to the right of the camera, you can see Stevens, Knoll, and Culp's Hill with artillery firing into the flanks of the Confederate attack. An extremely strong position on high ground. High ground that was chosen by the Union Army after the retreat through the town of Gettysburg on July 1st, which would also begin, mark the beginning of the Union fishhook. There would also be more 11th Corps regiments behind us in the Evergreen Cemetery. More artillery batteries up there. This was an extremely strong position anchored on the Baltimore Pike. The Baltimore Pike, which would be remaining in Union control throughout the Battle of Gettysburg. Some people consider this area the high water mark. And when you come out here today and you see the sheer beauty of this hill where you can see for miles, you can understand why the Confederates decided to try and make an effort to take this hill. If they could take this hill, East Cemetery Hill, on July 2nd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg is most likely over if the Baltimore Pike is lost. It was needed to bring both Union troops and Union supplies to the front lines. So it was almost poetic justice that this Corps, the 11th Corps soldiers, that were disgraced at the Battle of Chancellorsville just a few months earlier, performed so well on this portion of the battlefield on July 2nd, 1863. The failed attack would force the Confederates back down the hill, back into the town where they would have to regroup. General Robert E. Lee would come up with another plan to attack Culp's Hill early in the morning of July 3rd, 1863 as a diversionary fight while he would then concern himself with the center of the Union line at the copse of trees and the high water mark. So this has been the Battle of East Cemetery Hill on the evening of July 2nd, 1863. And now we will go back to finish the story of Colonel Isaac Edwin Avery and his final hours at Gettysburg. After being carried to the rear, the mortally wounded Isaac Avery was made as comfortable as possible. All the skills of his regimental surgeons, Dr. William L. Reese and John G. Hardy, proved to be in vain, however. Knowing that the end was near, Isaac's last thoughts were as of his aging father, home in Morgantown. Paralyzed on the right side, he desperately removed a piece of scrap paper from the pocket of his blood-soaked uniform. Because Avery apparently was unable to speak, a comrade and close friend, Major Samuel McDowell Tate of the 6th North Carolina, knelt by his side, holding firm the coarse paper. Colonel Avery slowly dipped a small stick or some unknown pointed object in his own blood and scribbled with his left hand, Major, tell my father I died with my face to the enemy. Just a few hours after scrawling that parchment, Avery passed away. Colonel Avery died on July 3rd, 1863, the same day as older brother, Colonel Clark Moulton of the 33rd North Carolina, also fell at Longstreet's assault on Cemetery Ridge that we know today as Pickett's Charge. He survived the Battle of Gettysburg, but would be killed the following year at the Battle of the Wilderness. Lieutenant Willoughby F. Avery of the 43rd North Carolina, who was Isaac's younger brother, was also wounded on the first day, July 1st, 1863, at Gettysburg. On July 4th, 1863, after General Lee decided to retreat from Gettysburg, a servant of Colonel Avery's named Elijah loaded Avery's body in a horse-drawn wagon 
and determined to take his massa home to North Carolina. The Confederate retreat slowly rolled through a 17-mile-long mud-splattered road with wounded and dying men. Under the command of General John B. Inboden, this ambulance, entitled the Train of Misery, finally reached the small riverfront town near Williamsport, Maryland, where it discovered the Potomac was at the flood stage too deep and treacherous for crossing. Avery be buried in Hagerstown. This has been the Battle of East Cemetery Hill and the Wounding of Isaac Avery.